Good to see you this morning. Some of you got a little extra sleep. Some of you stayed up an extra hour long. We'll know about midway through the sermon. <laughs> which is which. It is good to see you today. What a beautiful day. Hey, I was gone last week, enjoyed the time off, and it is so good to know that when I'm gone like that, we have somebody like Pastor Strickland and this band to step up and just do what needs to be done in the worship service and never miss it. Go ahead and praise the Lord for them again. Amen. What a blessing. We've been in a series of messages uh, we'll talk about in just a moment. But before I get there, I want to remind you about a study that we're beginning. Go ahead to the back of the desk of the rabbi, if you would. Go to that slide. Well, since you brought it up, I'll make it now. We're going to be in this, in this lift group study. I want to encourage you, if you have not been in lift group or you have recently dropped out of lift group, this is time to get back in. Two reasons. One, because this is a phenomenal study. In the Word of God. It is DVD driven, but it is Bible driven. So if you're looking for a good Bible study, this is a tremendous Bible study. It dives deep into the Word of God. The teaching is done on site in the Holy Land. So it's just it's extra interesting from that perspective visually. But the, the message and the meat of this is so great. The dust of the rabbis, the idea that if you, if you were following a rabbi of the day, you followed your rabbi so closely that the dust that he kicked up while he was walking got on your garments. So we want to walk so close to our rabbi, the Lord Jesus, that the dust he kicks up, we wear it proudly. Amen. But this is a great study. Ray Vanderlyn, we've done one of his studies in the past. He is such a great Bible teacher. You really don't want to miss this. You want to take the opportunity. That's the first reason. It just, it's just that good. It's something that you'll regret if you don't catch because people are going to be talking about a lot of the next few weeks. You're going to hear people just talking in the course of the day or before services, after service. Hey, that study's great. I love that part. You just want to be a part of this. The second reason is this, is this is our means of discipleship at Believer's Fellowship. This is one of the key things we do in growing the saints. You need to be in a lift group if you're a member of Believer's Fellowship. We stress this in our 101 class when we introduce the church, ministries of the church. We talk about it in our, our journey class 201. We're talking about maturity. There's just, there's nothing to replace place the, the biblical mandate that we need one another, we minister to one another, we encourage one another, we use our gifts with one another, and that happens more than any other place within our small group Bible studies. So there's Bible studies in the morning, Bible studies, there's one you can find. I encourage you, you know, to take the effort. There, you know, we're called as believers to invest our time, our talent, our treasures. Well, this is one of those areas where you invest your time. And the good part about when you give up, you receive, according to what the Bible says. You're going to be blessed by this. But another reason, you know, one of the most critical problems facing the 21st century church today, and I'm talking about uniquely to America, it's the dropout believer. People who used to be in church, who used to be in Bible studies, they really don't any longer go. They've just dropped out. They're no part of a, a local church. They've lost their, their place of connecting with other members. And not only in the main worship service, but in the Bible studies that follow, they just, they've dropped out. In fact, it is now stated in the United States, there's only about three out of every 10 adults that attend church today. Three out of 10. They say of the seven that don't go to church, they say four of those seven used to be in church. They used to be active. They used to be in Bible studies. They used to be a part of the fellowship, but they've dropped out. Now, part of that we'll be talking about today in the message series where we're at in our prophecy study. But a lot of it's folks that we just need to get back to loving people. If you see people out of church, give them a call. Tell them you missed them. Tell them you love them. Get them back in your lift group if they've been dropped out. You know, let's just make all the efforts to be on board for Jesus, especially in this dark age that we live in. We need to be bringing people back to the fold and back to the body and back into fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So I want to remind you, Dust the Rabbi, great, great, great study. My mother recommended this to me years ago, and I don't know why we didn't jump on it back then, but when I later got a hold of it, discovered it, and watched it in Tim, and hey, it's just a great study, so you, you don't want to miss this. Second thing I want to remind you of is that this, uh, this is our uh, Tuesday's election day. Y'all heard that, right? Y'all there's an election going on, and you need to get up off your blessed assurance and go vote. How many of you have already voted early? Wow, give them some, folks a good hand, amen. How many of you are procrastinated? Okay, that's the rest of you. Uh, go vote. Do you realize in America, we'll talk a little bit also in our message about this to some degree, but in America, last election 2012, 25 million evangelical Christians did not vote. Did not vote. You say, well, I don't like the choices. I don't like the choices either. I held my nose when I voted. <laughs> you know, but I know that this election affects the future or infects the future, whichever one you choose. 
And we need to make choices that are based on righteousness and upon the will of God as close as whatever they may get or may not get. We need to find out who's closest to the issues that are important to the church today because every one of us are influential and we're supposed to be light and salt. So get out, vote, be heard, make your opinion. You know that 12 million evangelical believers didn't even register to vote in 2012. 12 million. So God help us, amen? Get out and vote and uh, go to heaven. No, <laughs> you don't wanna to have to answer for it when you do get to heaven that you didn't vote, amen? So let's, let's look at our message today as we've been talking about uh, prophecy and getting into the word of God and discovering what the Bible has to say in the Old Testament and the New Testament and looking at this particular study, which by the way, is a long forgotten study from most pulpits in America today. We don't deal with these issues. And we'll get a little reason why today when we talk about this, because the title of this message is The Strong Delusion. Now, if you've been a member of Believer's Fellowship for a long time, you've probably heard me preach three times in 25 years on this text. Now, if you knew me before and when I was in evangelism for 16 years, I preached this text almost in every revival or crusade that I went to because it was a day that I saw back in the 70s and 80s that was approaching and that we were beginning to experience where it talks about the strong delusion but now I believe that we're in this day, at least the very beginning stages of it. You say, well, what do you mean by the strong delusion? Well, the second title is in preparation of antichrist because the world is going to receive this, this ungodly individual who ultimately becomes possessed of Satan himself, who steps on the scene as this massively charismatic worldwide leader that the world embraces and who comes up with this genius plan for peace in the Middle East. Well, we all know that the, for, for decades now, the Middle East has been the, the center of, of uh, crisis and, and world tragedy and, and war now for decades. And, you know, ever since the, the, the 40s, really, where it became the center point when Israel becomes a nation. But the Bible said it'd be like that in the end times. And we talked about that. In fact, remember, we, we, we've kind of been sharing this particular chart with you about the incarnation, the resurrection of Jesus Christ starts and begins the, the church age. And we have dealt with signs of the times from wars and famines and pestilence and earthquakes that would be in various places. We talked about the nation of Israel, the, the, the reconstitution of the nation of Israel, which is the key point in Bible prophecy. It's the thing we look to in Bible prophecy. It's the thing which scholars and theologians for centuries have been looking forward to. The restoration of the nation of Israel. Which even when Jesus is talking about the budding of the fig tree, the Israel coming back to life as a nation. And those prophecies deal with that from Daniel to Ezekiel to Jeremiah. Where they'd be desolate and scattered around the world. And there'd be, this, there'd, there'd, there'd be, there'd be a remnant of people, of, of the Jewish people. But... It wouldn't be until the end times that it would be the key to knowing that we were in the end times that Israel would be reconstituted, brought back together as a nation. We saw that in 1948. And since 1948, we've seen an exponential growth in what we would call the wars, the famines, the pestilence, the, you know, the earthquakes and all that's been happening. All right. Now, what happens, we talked about in our last message, at the, when, when the time comes, when it's on the, uh, the next little tick on the so-called talk of the clock, is, is, is the rapture of the church and the prophetic signs. We've seen enough things already happen. In fact, everything that needs to have happened for the rapture, the taking away of the church to happen has already happened. So the next big event really prophetically will be that we call the glorification of the saints. Remember when Jesus appears in the air, this is not the second coming. It's not what we call the glorious appearing. He appears in the air and the saints dead come from the graves to meet their souls with the Lord and the saints living are raised up incorruptible and with glorified bodies to be with the Lord. We go to heaven for a seven year period while hell breaks out on the earth. Somewhere in this process, right immediately probably following all the chaos, there's, a, there's this, this, the introduction of Antichrist to the world scene. Now, what starts the tribulation is sometime after the, the rapture, but when Antichrist signs a seven year peace treaty in the Middle East. So that begins that tribulation period. Remember, as we've talked about in the middle of tribulation, and we'll deal more with Antichrist and other studies we follow, but he comes and he declares himself to be God. And then wars and all those things that happened, wars, famines, pestilence, all that, earthquakes, that happened in various places as Jesus described. When the tribulation begins, they'll not happen in various places anymore. They'll happen all over the world. There'll be global events. As, as you see the bowls of wrath and the trumpets and the judgments that happen, all these are global events. And then we see where the Lord returns at the end of the tribulation and destroys the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming. Now, following this study and looking at this carefully 
as a young believer in the Lord in the early 70s, I kind of had this mindset. We certainly can't be in those times because, you know, nobody in this world is so divided and it's so, you know, spliced up into little segments and nations and groups of people. And there's such you know, lack of trust from anybody in the world for anybody else in the world. We can't even get along with our neighbors, much less neighboring countries. Amen. That how's the world going to believe this one guy when he steps on the scene with this peace treaty and they're going to embrace the Antichrist? And they're going to embrace this system of economics, you know, the, the mark of the beast. All that. How, how's that just possible? Well, it wasn't until I began to look into 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that I began to understand how the world will eventually believe this individual and how they will embrace not only believe him, but follow him fanatically. All right. And so we're going to look at that today well, said in preparation of Antichrist. And it may be something you've heard before, and I hope it just re reaffirms your, your commitment to understanding the, the signs of the times that we're living in. But if you maybe you hadn't heard this before, it might even be a little shocking to you to see what we're talking about here. Let's look at this passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. It says, now, brethren, I'm clicking. There we go. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in your mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as it from us, as though the day of the Lord had come. In other words, people started thinking, hey, did, we, did we miss the rapture? And we're all talking about the end times. And don't let anybody deceive you by, by any means for, for <clears throat> he said, you're okay for the, by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. We talked about the apostasy and religion that takes place. As though the day of Christ had come. All right, so don't be deceived. And this, that what's going to have to, he says, the, the, the man of sin is going to come. He's going to be revealed the son of perdition. And he opposes and exalts himself above all that's called God and its worship. So he sits as God in the temple of God, shows himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you, now you know what's restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. But he's saying the Antichrist is going to come. So, you know, the Lord hadn't, Lord hadn't taken us out yet because immediately after that, the Antichrist is going to make his place. So you're safe. The, the day the Lord hadn't come, or the blessed appearing hasn't come for the saints of God. So Antichrist has got to show up before that happened, or when that happened. So you know he's not around, so you know the rapture hadn't taken place. And he goes on to tell them not to be disturbed by all this. He says, for the mystery of lawlessness is at work. But only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Talking about when the church and the Holy Spirit are removed. Now the Holy Spirit's omnipresent, so he'll still be working in the tribulation. But that influence of the salt and light of the church is gone. When we're taken out of the way, you know, the, this lawlessness is going to abound. And the lawlessness will be revealed. And when the, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one, that's Antichrist, is according to the working of Satan with power and signs. And lying wonders. That's why a lot of people are going to believe him. There'll be power. He's going to manifest these great powers and demonstrate miraculous things. And, you know, but it's lying signs and wonders. And not only with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now, catch this next verse. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now you say, hey, there's coming a day, church, when the church will be taken away. Antichrist is going to make his move. People are going to believe him. He's going to have all these lying power, signs and wonders. But even beyond that, God says, I am going to get directly involved so that I'm going to send an influence. He calls it a strong delusion so that people will follow the lies of Antichrist and believe those lies. Now I believe, as I've stated all through this series, that we are living in a crisis day. These, these, can, these cannot be Days that we are sitting by just casually and think, well, is the Lord coming or maybe he's coming, maybe he's not coming. We need to get really serious about understanding the times that we live in. Like the men of Israel, the men of Issachar said they, they were men who understood the times. We need to realize that everything prophetically and everything that's given to us from scripture about prophecy certainly lines up. Scripture says, Jesus speaks, you don't know the day nor the hour, but you can know the seasons. And he says, when these things happen, and he mentions in Matthew 24, and he lists all those things that we've been talking about over the last several weeks. When you see these things, you know that my coming is nigh, even at that door. And when you start seeing these things, that were the budding of the fig tree, the nation of Israel, the, 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 the accelerated rate of famines, pestilence, plagues, earthquakes, famines. When you see all those things happen exponentially like they're happening. He says, you know my coming is very near. 
So the key right there, the key figure was that the, the nation of Israel followed by all these other signs is, hey, you need to realize that you're in the last days. In other words, you need to understand just as much as you would look out the window and you would see a dark clouds approaching, you know, a storm is coming. We look out the window of our Bible and look out prophetically with our prophetic vision glasses on and see what the Bible says. We ought to see that the skies are very dark with the approaching judgment of God. That it's going to happen and it's going to happen sooner than what most people believe. I believe this is the Saturday evening of the age. Sunday's just around the corner. And when it comes, it's going to be a glorious world when Jesus comes and takes the throne of David in Jerusalem for a thousand years. And then carries us on from there into eternity. In this book, in 2 Thessalonians, in this chapter, he deals specifically with, well, there's about five things that we read about that, that are mentioned here. Let me just list them out. He talks about the falling away of, the, of, of, of supposed Christians. You should know that today there are thousands upon millions of people who fill churches today. And many of them just really don't know the Lord. And many do. But what's going to happen we're seeing it already happening as there's this apostasy that takes place in the end times where people begin to reject the truth of the word of God. They'll call themselves Christians. They bear the name of Christians. But when it really comes down to living it, truly believing it, truly claiming it, truly living it out in their life, that's not really happening. So he talks about, then he talks about the, the taking away, the rapture of the church. He says, don't be, ashamed, don't be afraid that hasn't happened yet, but it's coming. But he said the Antichrist is going to be revealed in those days. He talked about it in verse 9. And he says, following that, there's going to be a great tribulation, seven years of hell on earth. It talks about in Daniel. It talks about the book of Revelation, Matthew 24, some other places. And then we see at the end of that period where the Lord appears and destroys the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming. All right. Now, let me just back up a little bit when I said, I thought back in the early 70s, how would it be possible for people you know, to believe Antichrist. But if you'll think for a moment, since those days of the early 70s, we've seen so many things happen globally. In fact, it just takes a 24-hour period for the world to change. I mean, uh, look at the Shah of Iran going down and Khomeini coming to power overnight. The whole Middle East scene changed immediately, overnight. So we know that global event, one global event can change the world in just a, a matter of hours. But look what's happened in this period of time. If, if you're as old as I are, amen, You've seen this world stage set with this new world mindset, this globalistic mindset, this, this whole idea of having a, a, a global world and a new world order. We've seen language barriers broken. We've seen uh, digitally the economic, the economic system of, of transferring money, the exchange of funds, all that's, uh, that's all happened in the last you know, 30 years. We're seeing all these incredible, these, we call them advances take place. But all those advances had to take place for all these things in the Bible to be fulfilled. So you've seen the electronic funds transferred. You see now we have global newscasts. We have global weights and measure systems. We now have seen what the Bible talks about in the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel about a new world order that would rise out of Europe. Uh, it ultimately is a replacement of the old Roman Empire through now through the confederations of nations that have been developed under the, the European Union that we've, we have seen developed since that period in the early 70s. It came out from the European Economic Market, now to a European Union. It's basically a confederation of, 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 of nations with no borders and the, you know, the whole idea of having a one world economic structure in the, that they share in that midst. That's all happening before our eyes. But all those things were prophesied thousands of years ago. That it would be like that in the end time. That alone ought to shake your foundation on some level. These were things that said would, would, would happen in the end times. We have now one world police and court system. And now with terrorism being so global and so rampant, we're seeing more now unification of nations than there's been in any other times. And so the world stage seems to be ready. The lights are on. Scene one begins as we have this new whole approach to the world. And it says, when all this begins to take place in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now the main reason that the world is going to receive Antichrist and believe his lies and accept his proposals is this very verse. God will send them a strong delusion that they would believe a lie. This is all in reference to the end times. It's all in reference to Antichrist. It's all in reference. And we know he's going to try to change the world to his liking. He'll be ultimately possessed of the devil himself. 
He'll be very persuasive. Ultimately, the pride of, of, of arrogance and Satanism enters his head, declares himself to be God, takes a seat in the, in the throne in Jerusalem and says, I'm God. And so in the beginning, but the world receives him. It says, well, how's that going to happen? Well, beyond the consistent decay of our culture, you had this fact here. A strong delusion. I think New American Standards might say a deluding influence. Here's the way it breaks down in the Greek language. If you look at these particular words here, it says a strong delusion. The word for sin, it says God will send a strong delusion, is the word pampo in the Greek language. And it was used specifically in the context of sending someone on an errand, but it was a temporary errand. In other words, God's going to do something, all right? Beyond the, the, the willing, full self-deceit that people choose to live in and ignorance and rejection of God's word, which brings deception itself, the Bible says we shouldn't be deceived through the deceitfulness of sin. That's a natural process. When we reject the truth, guess what happens? We choose to believe lies. I mean, that's the only alternative to truth, right? Is a lie. That's just common sense. There's a right way, wrong way, broad road, narrow road, life, hell, death, or, you know, you choose those paths. He said, but here's, God's going to do something. In fact, this word for send here, this particular word is unique in the Greek language of sending on a temporary errand is used specifically three times in the book of Revelation when God sends the angels to thrust in those judgments and, and those, 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 those pestilences of the end times and the judgments during, during the, the, the time of, of tribulation. So here we see God moving in a way, but God is doing this, all right? And it says, what will God do? He will send a strong delusion. That word strong is the word for energy. We get the word for energy from. And it translates as an, as an operation or, or, or strong effectual working. That God's going to literally, sovereignly, divinely interrupt time and space on the planet and send an influence into the world. It's going to influence the way people think. So that people, that people will believe the lies you say, well, that's just hard. Why would God do that? Because they've already done it themselves. You know, when people, you can't say, well, God's going to judge. No, it's a righteous judgment because God, these people have already moved to reject God. They've already removed to resist the Lord. So now he adds to that deception of Satan with this delusion from God. In fact, the word delusion is an interesting word here in the Greek language. It's the word plane, which we get the idea of being a fraud or being fraudulent. And a lot of times it talks about straying away, you know, from... Uh, from what's orthodox or what's reality or what's, what's acceptable. But as he, as he looks at this, it's a strong delusion. It's a, it's a, it's a deceitfulness. It enters into the hearts and the minds of people. In, the, in 2 Thessalonians 2.11, the American version, it's, it's, just, it's, 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 it's the word delusion. The vast standard says he sends this error into their thinking. In other words, there's, there's this strange, frightening occurrence that God creates. It's a misleading, deceptive force that allows, that people will allow themselves willingly to be darkened in their understanding so that it says there, so that they believe a lie. So the idea is that when this deception comes that people not only believe a lie, they fanatically commit to follow the lie. That the concepts of truth have now completely failed in their thinking. The concepts of right and wrong are failed. What's important is what they think. That's all. Now, are we experiencing delusion? Well, I think we're in the early stages I think we've not yet seen what God will do once the rapture takes place. But I do believe that the culturally, morally, you know, uh, on so many different wor levels, uh, philosophically, we are seeing the beginning of a strong delusion. First of all, I believe it's right in this, this regard to our, our thinking. But we are experiencing a mental, philosophical delusion in the world. Understand that when Satan wants to invade any of our lives, when he wants to darken our minds or when he wants to deceive us on any level, it, the battle is always in the mind. All right. Now, it's, it's the battle. That's the battleground. It's, it's first attempt. The Bible said every man is led away of his own desires. Satan approaches us in the context of our desires and mentally tries to, you know, mess with our thinking about between righteousness and unrighteousness and truth and a lie. And he begins to move on our life there. But listen, I tell you, as a nation, we are experiencing, I think, the very beginnings. And it's not just in the world itself. I believe it's also in the church in America as well. You know, most people in this country, contrary to what President Obama said a few years ago, uh, still identify themselves as Christians. 
All right. In fact, many theologians call this the post-Christian era. No, about 73% of this nation still testifies that they, they are Christian or adopt a Christian faith or a, a Christian view. All right. So, but the influence of that Christianity obviously is post. <laughs> you know, no longer are we influencing the culture like we used to influence the culture. No longer are we shining like a lighthouse on a dark shore, helping people evade the rocks and and the collisions of their life. No longer do we stand as a candle in the dark, helping people find light and life. That has diminished tremendously because part of it is this end time approach. But if you follow this little graph, and I don't know how how, how readable it is back to you there, but there's a a group of people, there's about 20% of people who say that, well, they they claim no faith at all. That would be the atheist and the agnostics. 6% on that graph, they identify with with a different faith other than Christianity. And and really it's Islam, Buddhism, Judaism, Hinduism, you know, uh, and then you get 1% that just aren't sure. Some of you have neighbors like that, right? They're just not sure of anything. But the, ultimately, you see 73% of people, at least in words, will identify themselves as Christians, all right? 73%. And they basically will tell you that faith and religion are very important in, in our life, all right? Now, if you broke that down a little bit, 52 strongly agree, 20%, 1% kind of mildly agree with it's really important in life. But I want to show you another chart, if it's clear, hopefully not, I'll explain it as we go if it's not real clear on the chart. But you'll see that having a, basically saying I believe and having a commitment to what I believe are really two different things. In fact, George Barner did this survey and this is is just very recent, it's only a couple of months old. It was was released in in April of, of 2016. According to this, you know, uh, the, the Barnes survey people use several identifying factors within people who profess Christianity uh, and kind of grouped it out. And they broke it down into three groups. One, they said there's born again Christians, evangelical Christians, and Bible minded Christians. They said about 35% of, our, of the 70 some odd percent of the nation who say they're Christians, 35% of those will declare that they are born again Christians. All right. They, they basically say that uh, we have made a personal commitment. We believe in Jesus. We've prayed to prayer, you know, uh, you know, the Bible's important to us on some level. And I believe that when I die, because I've confessed my sins and I'm going to go to heaven. But there's another group, what we call Bible, excuse me, back that up. The Bible minded group, it's in the middle there. All right. The Bible minded, those who make about one quarter of this population of believers, they believe the Bible is accurate in all the principles and all that it teaches. And they re- they've read the scriptures at least once in the past week. All right. So they not only just say they have faith, but they at least they're, they're, they, they open their Bible. There's a group. Amen. And say, you know, I believe what the Bible says. But there's another 7% of that group. All right. 7%. They identify themselves as evangelicals. Now, this is a very influential group. They not only meet the born again criteria, They also meet the Bible-believing, Bible-minded criteria. But this group, you know, you you can ask politicians, this group is very influential in the nation if you can get them to do something. (laughs) Even if you can get them to the voting booth, they they can make a difference. But this this 7%, they not only say that we're born again, not only say we're Bible-minded, there were seven other basic principles that they listed that were important to their life. One, they, they share their religious beliefs. They weren't content to go to church and not tell anybody else about Jesus. This 7%, now you can ask yourself if you're part of the 7% when I walk through this. Do you share your faith regularly? Two, they believe in the reality of a personal devil. Three, they believe that Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. He was the son of God. They believe the Bible is accurate in everything it teaches. Number four, five, they believe eternal salvation is only possible through the grace of God and it's not by works that we're saved, it's only by grace. And the last is they describe God as the all-knowing, all-powerful, sovereign, perfect deity who created the universe and still rules over it today. That's the 7%. So you see that although there's 73%, a large number of believer people that say they're believers, there's only a small handful of people who actually practice what they believe, who actually, who actually do what they say. You know, when, when their mouth is in gear, it's backed up by their life being in gear with what's going on. Now, the rest of the nation, and it includes many of this, this, this group of 35 and 23% even, they really embrace two ideas. And I, and I saw this, and I've quoted this before in sermons, 
But I saw this, I think I was sitting in a, in a, a gynecologist's office while Kathy was seeing the pregnancy doctor, you know, and it was a Time magazine, late 70s, early 80s, and, they, and the article was what, what Americans believe, all right? And there, there were two things they said what most Americans believe. One is this, nobody has a right to tell me what I can do or what I can't do. I am my own man. Nobody has the authority, nobody has a right. But we're seeing that more than ever before in the culture we live in. The other one is this. There's just really no absolutes. You know? So there's nothing absolute anymore. It's all about, you know, uh, relativism. Or we use the term that might be more uh, common with situation ethics. That basically says the mindset of humanism, relativism, situation ethics says, you know, there are really no more moral absolutes, you know, that, there, that we know the Bible, at least the Ten Commandments, is filled with moral absolutes. Thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal, you don't commit adultery, you know, you, you don't covet your neighbor's wife. All, all these strong commandments from the Word of God, we say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what's happened and what, what part of this delusion is that people say that in their mind, but they don't act it out in their life. In reality, they may say, thou shalt not lie, but they really believe, thou shalt not lie in most situations. But the Bible says, if you lie, when it says, thou shalt not lie, and you do lie, that makes you a what? A what? I can't hear you. Makes you a liar, right? The Bible says, thou shalt not steal. We say, amen, thou shalt not steal. Hey, careful, you know, unless nobody's looking. You know, mom's not going to know if I take a little cash out of the purse. You know? You're not going to miss that money on the countertop. Hey, and, and you know, the boss really doesn't pay me what I'm worth anyway. So I'm just going to take a few things home. They won't miss them because I've earned it. No, thou shalt not steal. So if you're steal, you're a, you're a what? If you steal something, you're a, see, we don't want to admit we're a thief. So we just change what the meanings are. All right. We, we don't, we don't embrace that. But that's where the culture is. And this is, this is all part of it. We, we, we look at it now and we say, you know, how, you know how's this going to work? We already see how it's already working already in our mindset and in our philosophical view of things. We can say one thing. We can, we can embrace a truth, so to say, and still live something else. That's the lie of the age. Every man did what was right in his own sight. That was the epitaph, epitaph on, on the graves of so many people that died in the flood. That was a generational statement. They all did what was right in their own eyes. It's like, I'm okay, you're okay. You do what you want, I'll do what I want. If it's okay with me, then it's okay. Excuse me, just because somehow you've anesthetized your conscience and you think it's okay, doesn't mean it's okay. There is a standard. You ought to praise the Lord, amen. There is a standard. And what is that standard? It's the Bible, it's the word of God. Of course, I did notice this the other day when I was talking about the 10 commandments. Uh, I read this, the real reason we can't have the 10 commandments in courthouses today you know what it is? Here it is. You cannot post, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, and thou shalt not lie in a building full of lawyers, judges, and politicians. <laughs> it creates a hostile work environment. <laughs> now, the real reason is because we've rejected God. We don't want his standards. We don't want his truth. You know, if anybody holds a standard, oh, you're just judging everybody. No, you're just telling truth. But so we're experiencing this philosophical, it starts here in the mind, but it pours out in the culture and the way we live. We're also experiencing a cultural delusion and we're experiencing the cultural delusion because we've rejected the word of God and we've rejected those moral absolutes. There, there, Barney went on and gave another chart recently that, that came out as well. And it came out the, from the uh, from American Bible Society review that they did. And the question was posed within this particular study, uh, about absolute truth versus moral relativism. You know, believe what you want to believe, situation ethics. The, 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 it said, do you agree or disagree with the following statement? Here was the statement. The Bible contains everything a person needs to know to live a meaningful life. Now, on the left, there was, there was those who strongly agree, those who agree somewhat, those who disagree somewhat, and those who disagree strongly. Now, I don't know if you can read all the numbers, but on, on one side, the chart is 2011, progresses through 2016. You have six years that go by. In just six years, you see that, that, that 53% of people who agree strongly the Bible is everything we need for life and godliness and holy living and, and truth, that 53%. By the way, if you'd marched back 10 years before that, it was much higher. It was almost, it was almost 70%, 80%. But what's happening, we're seeing this diminishing effect that takes place. And it takes place because we reject the word of God, all right? 
Those who would agree strongly, 2016, it's 45%. Back in 2011, those who agree somewhat, I've always known those people, 22%, down to 21%. They disagree somewhat that the Bible is what we need for truth and life and liberty and loving. Hey, 11%, but now it's 15%. Disagree strongly, 12%, now up to 18%. They disagree strongly that the Bible is the answer for man's, man's need. They disagree, and the Bible is rejected today. Still the most read book in the world, but still the most rejected book. That's why Satan's always tried to stomp out the word of God. We've discovered that he can't stomp out the word of God. It's eternal, it's everlasting. So what he tries to do is, is to somehow affect and darken the hearts of people to believe a lie so they won't receive the truth. And what happens when we start believing our lies because we don't want to be convicted and we don't want to be influenced by truth. We want to do our own thing. Nobody has the right to tell me what to do. Nobody has to tell me what's wrong or right. I decide what's wrong or right. We become our own God and our own judge and jury at that point. And we live in deception because, hey, there is a judge still on the seat. He's still at the justice table. And he's still going to have every one of us stand before him. But we deceive ourselves. So we've seen this incredible shift in the overall worldview of, of, of most people. Many of once held truth as truth. But they no longer perceive truth as a black and white issue, you know, wrong or right issue. Now we have this new standard, which is not a standard, which is always shifting and always changing. You know, the Bible calls itself the plumb line, which means it's, it's the measure which is true and it's always true. If we're building a wall, we bring the wall and construct it according to what the plumb line. It's basically just a string with a weight on it. And it drops in its weight and holds the true line of what is straight. If I build my house according to what's right and just and straight, it's most likely that wall's not going to blow over. But what happens if I decide what's right and straight myself? I'm creating a crisis that's going to show up in every area of my life eventually. Jesus warned about this. He told his disciples about it. In fact, he called it the leaven. L-E-A-V-N. It's like yeast. When you, put, when you put a yeast in the flour in the dough mixture, what happens? The, the chemical reaction to the heat in the oven and even the heat in the atmosphere causes it to begin to expand and it fills up and it's not, it's not all you think it's going to be. It's full of hot air. And he said, Jesus is basically saying, if you choose to believe the leaven and in other words, take the world and mix, try to mix it in with your faith to do whatever you want to do, it, all you are just full of hot air. There's no reality there. There's no real substance there. It looks good. It's like going and buying the half gallon of ice cream that's been shot up with air. You know, there's companies that do that. There's more air in there than there's ice cream in there, in the jug. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's the way you make things appear what they really aren't. Jesus used this warning and he talked about it on, on, on three levels. He said, avoid the, he said, avo avoid the, the leaven, you know, of the, of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he warned in Mark about the leaven of Herod. Now, those three things represent Obviously, one thing, it's, it's human imperfection. It's human philosophy. It's human truth, which is not truth, all right? And he says, you need to be aware of, of basically adding these things, what the world thinks, with what God says. He, he used it not just to symbolize imperfection. He talked about it on three levels. He talked about, he warned about mixing the, the imperfect of human ideas with God's truth in regard to the Pharisees. The Pharisees had developed a religious system and traditions using the scriptures. They kind of took the word of God and says, here's what it means according to our understanding. There's a problem with that. The word of God means what it says. Amen. You don't have to add your perspective or your spin on it. Amen. Guess what? When the Bible says, thou shalt not lie, that's it. it you, you don't need any more additional truth. <laughs> you don't lie. You shouldn't live a lie. You shouldn't tell lies. You shouldn't act on lies. You shouldn't believe lies, all right? Then he talked about the, the, the leaven of the, of the Sadducees. They were the modern philosophers in, of the Jewish culture and the Jewish society of that day. And then he talked about Herod. Herod repre represented Rome on behalf of Rome. He declared himself to be Jews. The Jews couldn't stand him because he was such a hypocrite because he, he embraced that Roman mindset. And he reigned under Rome authority and he imposed Roman rules. And, but he, he pretended to be something else. So, so there's basically a, a warning here that these influences of tradition, philosophy, social, social ideas, they seem to inevitably work their way into our thinking and, and become part of our value system. 
And we can't allow that to take place. Our value system is not based upon what the world says is acceptable or unacceptable. According to the world system, it's unacceptable for me to stand here in this pulpit this morning and tell you that the Bible says certain things and certain ways of living are sin. That's hate speech to the world. So Jesus says, don't let the world influence your thinking. Let the Bible influence your thinking, all right? To such an, is an extent, you know, that you can embrace truth no matter what the system is. But we've done just the opposite of that. We've kind of lived with this idea that we've embraced the tradition, the philosophy, the societal ideas of the world around us, that we've, we've kind of rejected the value system of God, accepted the value system of the community to such an extent in most people's mind, it's possible to be a really on fire Christian, but live with almost an entirely a pagan value system. All right? And just say, you know, well, I'm a Christian, but yeah, I'm living like the devil. I'm a Christian, but I'm living like the world. So you see that this delusion happens as you begin to reject truth. What are you going to accept? Well, you accept a lie. But we're also experiencing on another level, I believe, a moral delusion. All right? It's that mindset born in the 60s. If it feels good, do it. It's still the same. People do what, what they like, what feels good to them. I remember back in those days when that big movement started, you know, the free sex mindset of the 60s. Dr. Ruth was a, was a, a spokesman for the, the culture at that time. Remember Dr. Ruth? She was the one who came out and said, abstinence is a cuss word. Said everybody just ought to do whatever feels good to them. Of course, since that, if you follow the cultural trend of that and, and, and the flow of that, where, where has it taken us? Well, it's taken us to, you know, a popular push for contraceptives among teens. What's, where's that taken us? Well, uh, teenage and sexual activity and pregnancy, it's increased by 400% pregnancy among teens. By the way, 70% of those unwed teen mothers go on welfare. 70% of the teens who do marry because of pregnancy, 60% will end up divorced in five years. Isn't it amazing? In fact, there was a study at a Midwestern school that said 80% of the young girls who have a intercourse with a young man in their mind hope to marry that partner. But on the other hand, those young boys, only 12% of them had the same expectation. This is the world we live in. People reject absolutes. And what is it, where do we end up? We end up with crisis. We end up with trouble. We end up with problems. We end up with issues that are, that are, that are destroying the culture. In fact, you don't hear a lot of people even talk about premarital sex anymore, adultery anymore, heterosexual sins of fornication anymore. Why? There's so much emphasis on the LGBTQ community and the media push behind all that to make all that acceptable as, 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 as acceptable social values that there's, there's no longer considerations for those other things being sin. We've had this moral corruption and delusion. You add to that the pornography issue. It's an ever increasing problem in the world around us, an ever increasing problem among our teenagers an ever increasing problems among our adults and we're paying the price for it. It's costing us in terms of marriage relationships. Don't imagine that the spiraling divorce rates don't you imagine that the spiraling divorce rates have a connection with all this pornography in our culture? You know it does. Increasingly, relationship counselors are reporting more and more problems because of pornography use, specifically in relationship to the internet. It's costing us in terms of our marriages. It's costing us in terms of our children. This constant and continual, radical, out of control, rate growing of pedophilia among our children, it's not an accident. It's a symptom of rejecting standards and rejecting God's word and rejecting God's will. And our children are paying the price for it. In fact, it's are simple. 100% of pedophiles are pornography users. It's costing us in social terms. It's costing us in economic terms. There's a direct correlation between pornography and crime, particularly in the area of rape. But yet it's so wide accepted. We make jokes about it on TV. We make jokes about people being catching their sons, their daughters. It's not a big issue. They just got caught. Shame on you. Big deal. It's not funny. It's destroying us. We're experiencing a domestic delusion as well. A delusion that's affecting us within our homes. You say, what's wrong with America? I remember William Bennett put out this study and it still holds true today. I don't know, 
said according to the indicators that he found in 1960, while the, the gross domestic product was, was, was high as it had ever been, you know, in, in, in such a long time. At that point in time, it had, it had tripled. He said, but at the same time, violent crime had increased 560%. Divorces had more than doubled. The percentage of children in single parent homes had tripled. By the end of the decade, they said 40% of all American births, 80% of the minority births will incur in homes without both parents out of wedlock. 50 years ago, it was apt to say our, our parents are having lots of kids. But today, nowadays, kids are apt to say they have lots of parents. Divorce is accepted. God condemns divorce. God rebukes the people of Israel. He said, you have forsaken your covenant partner. That's divorce. Now it's become a relationship. And Margaret Mead, I believe she was an Alaska representative years ago, said, you know, there's just no way for one man to stay married to marry one woman for a whole lifetime. So I'd like to encourage us to offer marriage license instead of expiration dates. Isn't that ridiculous? Homes are complete. We have children in rebellion to God, children in rebellion to the parents. That whole delusion has entered into the mindset of children. You watch any, uh, any sitcom on TV that's based on family. Parents are idiots. Children are smarter. There's back talking. You know. Deception. Acceptable attitudes according to culture. Children are treating their parents like dirt. They ignore God. They get away with ignoring their parents. They get away with ignoring God. Parents, they say, communicate with their children on an average of 35 seconds a day in a worldly secular home. Review of done of top Fortune 500 companies, men who became wealthy, they said we became wealthy at the cost of our families. Major, majority of those men that they interviewed of the Fortune 500 companies of the top 100 executives, 100 executives in this nation, they said we would never do it again if we could go back and change it. You add to this cultural delusion, the philosophical delusion, the moral delusion, the domestic delusion, you add to all that, the, the worst I think is the political, demonic attack against our home, the whole mindset of the traditional family that God gives us in the scripture of one man married to one woman. You know, what, what would we, what's the popular saying? What have we learned from history? We've learned from history that history teaches us what? Nothing. We don't learn anything from the lessons beyond. But all we have to do is step back to a similar culture and time. It was called the Roman Empire. Very similar, you know, it was the greatest nation, the greatest empire of the time. America's the greatest empire of our time. But Rome was destroyed from within, not from the enemies without. Gibbons did his great thesis on Rome and he listed the things that were responsible for, for the deception and for the lies and for the fall of the, of, of the, of the Romans, which are similar to what's happening in our own nation. What's, what's the problem? Following Gibbons thesis, he said, homosexuality was the key reason for the national destruction of Rome. But yet the LGBT community, everybody wants to weigh in on it. They want to have relationships with anybody they want to have relationships with, change their sexual identification, change their gender identification. But these are all things that the Bible speaks very clearly against. But isn't it interesting that if I speak against it or you speak against it in the culture you live in, you're considered a hater. But if they want to speak against the Christian who embraces certain truths, then they're not a hater. They're just wise people. So we're told how to think and we're told how to live. Politicians in the world and the, 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 the traditions of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and Herod have weighed in on the hearts and minds. I, I, particularly two weeks ago when Miley Cyrus came out and said, well, I, I, I'm not LGBTQ or any of those things. I'm just a pansexual. What does that mean? It's all going to pan out? <laughs> Just across all the boundaries, across all the borders. Well, the problem is there are no boundaries and there are no borders in the culture we live in. I'm not ashamed to say I believe in the biblical values. I'm not ashamed to walk into a voting booth and promote biblical values. As I said, I had to hold my nose. I'm serious about that. I don't like either one of the candidates, but I do know that there's two different platforms that are being presented to us. And there's some very clear things as a Christian that I cannot, I cannot embrace. I cannot embrace the killing of another baby for the convenience of some woman. I just can't do that. You say, why can't you do it? Because God says he hates the taking of innocent life. God says, I formed you in, in your womb, not out your womb. It was in your womb that I put my stamp upon you. It was in your womb that I gave you your calling. It was in the womb. Jeremiah said he was called from his mother's womb. 
It's in the womb where we're developed, where God's hand and, and, and work is in our life and the miracle takes place within that womb. Amen. Life begins there, not when the first breath is drawn. But yet there are those in political parties who just soon kill a baby as it's being birthed and have no problem with it. Not according to the Bible, I've got a problem with it. So I'm going to vote on those issues that I know will be important. The issues that are clearly light and salt issues. Clearly the word of God. I am not going to bow down and cow town to the popular ideas of this culture when they are so opposed to the will of God and God's word. Let me just kind of close these last few minutes here saying I believe much of this is, this, this is, this is being fueled by Obviously, the deception of our culture, but I believe God's also going to get in on this thing as well. But we have to be careful as believers. The Bible says in Matthew 24, and it's a prophetic passage, which says when Jesus speaks, he says, listen, the love of many Christians is going to grow cold because iniquity is going to abound. And iniquity is abounding us. People not only are abounding in their iniquity, they're arrogantly proud of their sins. They put up banners. They put up posters. They embrace logos and themes that... that, that that applaud their iniquity and their immoral lifestyle. That's the age that we're living in. It's the age which we got to be careful not to be drawn into. There are certain things that are right and certain things that are wrong. We need to embrace truth and don't ever believe the lie. And until we do, until we make some decisions in our life about what we allow in our life, what we accept in our life, and what, we, what we're going to be a part of in our life, until we do that, we're just kidding ourselves about really living for Jesus Christ. If we're going to confess Christ as our Lord, then it should make a difference in the way I speak, the way I treat my wife, the way I speak to my children, the way I deal with my church and the community, the way I love lost people. It all is affected by my love for Jesus Christ. I don't approve of them. I will speak against those things, but I love them and I'll seek to correct them and to show them light. That's how I got saved. Somebody had the courage to hold the light up. It wasn't acceptable when they heard they told me I was a sinner. My lifestyle was immoral, that I was ungodly and selfish. I didn't like hearing that, but that's the truth I needed. Amen. And it was the truth that set me free. It didn't bring me into bondage. So, uh, you know, how, how can I know if I'm, I'm being deceived and I'm, that I'm being drawn into this culture? When there are certain things in the Bible that are wrong and you say something like this. I don't see anything wrong with that. What's happened? The blinders are coming over us. You know, the blinders come over us. I don't see anything wrong with it because we believe a lie. The Bible says whatever things are lovely, pure, a good report. Think on these things. But what do we think on? We watch anything, listen to anything, go to any movie. We just let all kinds of guns come in our minds, our hearts. And don't think that it's not a faith. Well, I'm a strong Christian. Yeah, how strong? How many people you want to Jesus lately? That tells me how strong Christian you are. How many people did you invite to the Lord? How many people you even share the gospel with? You know, maybe you didn't win, but you shared the gospel with. That tells me if you're, how much of the word of God is important? How much did you read the Bible? That, that's not legalism. That's not, that's just, I'm just saying, if, you, if you're a spiritual person, you have spiritual appetites. Amen. If you're a carnal person, you have carnal appetites. Well, where's it going to go in this? What happens? We, we choose to believe a lie. Let me just, just simplify this and say, where are you in your, your spiritual? And I have to ask myself this all the time. Where am I in my spiritual relationship? Where do I want to be in my spiritual relationship? Well, if I want to be where God wants me to be, then I'm going to have to make some decisions, aren't I? And some of them are tough decisions. Yes, the culture says it's all right. We're legalizing pot. We're, you know, we've already legalized drugs in, in, in other ways. It's called alcohol. Can you imagine what would happen in the culture today if we took the same stance against alcohol as we did with cigarettes? And the only reason we haven't, because show me the money, too much money in it, too much tax dollars, too much, too much money coming through that way. Same thing we want to do with the pot. That's why these nations are slowly going to allow pot in every state. Because it's all about the money. It's not about the lives. The government is set in place to protect the people. We don't protect the people. We introduce damaging things and philosophies which ruin their lives. We legalize the killing of babies. That doesn't help anybody. Nobody gets helped by that. Say, Brother Joe, you're on a soapbox. I'm getting ready to add another one to it. <laughs> Climb up a little higher. Because nobody's on the soapbox these days hardly. Now, what happens in our life? We just accept stuff. We look around the corner. Hey, so-and-so's having a, a drink. I think I'll have a drink. 
Now, I'm not going to get into this issue, but I want you to know what was, what's acceptable drink back in the time of Jesus is not anything like we have acceptable drink today. The content of the alcohol is far, far, far beyond what the contents were in that day. The Bible warns against strong drink. And the Bible gives clear instruction. If you really want to be godly, if you want to be a leader, if you want to be the difference maker in your culture and society, then the Bible forbids it at all. You follow the leaders, all right, through scripture where God says, don't, okay, don't do this, don't do that, and don't drink alcohol. Don't do it, don't do it. Well, it's just, it's, just, it's just social drink. Well, that's the leaven of the Pharisees, right? <laughs> I want to be social. We don't need to be social, we need to be Christian. Most social drinkers are social drunks. I find that most of them, possibly, but not all, but most. Can I have a drink? Folks, I want you to know, in Christ, you're not under the law, but you are under a call to holiness. And you're under a call to make a difference in the world. And I know if I'm sitting here with a Bud Light on the pulpit this morning, preaching to you about Jesus, you're not going to believe a thing I say. And I know that if I'm sitting here trying to share the gospel with you and I'm sucking on a marble at the same time, you're not going to believe a thing I say because you're looking for something that's going to make a difference in your life. You don't want to be like everybody else. You're looking for change. You're looking for something that will turn your life around. You're looking for something that will introduce you to fullness of life. And if you're just like the world, you're not going to reach the world. The idea, the myth is that you become all things to all men is not what you think it is. It doesn't mean you do what everybody else does, listen to what everybody else, act like everybody else, drink what everybody else, smoke what everybody else does so you can reach them. It doesn't work that way. And any lost person will tell you that. You didn't know you can get preaching on time, daylight savings time. Let me wrap it up. I know I said that, but now I really am. Who's it going to happen to this strong delusion? He very clearly tells us in verse 10. If you don't receive the love of the truth, if you're not willing to embrace truth and love it, this is good stuff. This is where liberty is. The liberty is that you can't smoke. No, the liberty is I don't have to. I don't need to. It doesn't do anything for me. It's not going to help me anyway, so I don't need it. it was, well, you don't get to drink. No, no, no problem with me. I drink enough back then to drown a sailor. <laughs> I don't need to. Why? Well, I just need a little shot to make me happy. I don't. Let the peace of God rule your heart. I don't have to. There was a time I had to. I was bound by sin. I mean, I'd get up in the morning, the breakfast of champions was Coors beer, not light. To me, you know, that light beer, when it came around, was a fat beer drinker's dream come true. That was the breakfast of champions. I mean, that's the way I started my day. That's the way I ended my day. That and about no telling how much of a dope was smoked, the pills were popped. Hey, I got set free. I don't have to. I don't have to be the star at the party. I don't have to be the most popular anymore. I'm not forced into all those ways of living because I'm so incomplete and so insecure. I'm secure now. I'm complete now. I don't have to add anything out there to make me happy in here. Yeah. Hallelujah. And neither do you. So quit looking down these avenues of the world. Say, well, I can be accepted if I do this and I'll be popular if I do this and everybody else. Do it. And now the, you know, the president says this was all right to have this kind of, of sexual relationship. So we can, you know, uh, we can do that and, and on and on it goes. Hey, quit looking for a way out. Start looking for a way in. Start looking for a way to walk closer with Jesus. Start looking for a way to live for God. Don't reject the truth of God anymore. Because those who do not receive the love of the truth and those who do not believe the truth, there's going to become a great influence that's going to deceive them on even a higher level. Paul talked about in Romans is, you know the judgment of God. If you do, you do those things, you're worthy of death. We have a culture now that not only does those things, but they have pleasure. and takes pleasure in them that do them. When's it going to happen? The last days. What's going to happen? Strong delusion. But you can see how easily it'll happen because we're already there. Pastor Joe, what can I do? What you can do is love God with all your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength. Be the different person. You know, you know what draws us to God? You know what draws us to Jesus? He's so unique. There's nobody like Jesus. We call that being unique, right? There's a Bible word for that. You know what it is? It's called Holy. Extremely, extraordinarily, supernaturally, uniquely unique. And when I see Jesus' love on the cross dying for me, who was so filled with sin, yes. you know, the stain of sin was all over me. Yes. And I see that unique love of God 
Scarcely for a righteous man would, would one die, much less an unrighteous man. But he laid his life down for all sinners. And he was perfectly God. That uniqueness drew me to him, that he loved me in spite of me. And it should be that uniqueness, that holiness that I embrace so that I also want to be like that. Amen. I'll be the friend of sinners, yes. but I won't commit their sins. That's Jesus, right? Amen. That's Jesus. And so people see us so unique, so different, and so full of life and love and grace that they're drawn to us. That's what makes us light and salt. Love God. Love God more than you've ever loved God before. Heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. Let's stand.